Hello and good evening to everyone. Thank you very much for joining me for hopefully another presentation that should be of interest to my audience as we continue to explore the science around the COVID-19 pandemic. Today I'll be talking with Thomas Haviland and he has been doing an international survey with embalmers to look at abnormal clots. And his findings have been interesting. He was interviewed in May of 2023, and we, he's done the research again. And so we want to catch up to see what exactly is happening. Before I start, I just want to highlight that two things, really, that coming up here in the next few days, this is Thursday, 25th of January, we're talking about nitric oxide and COVID. This is part of our Kickstarter program. And if you want to register for it, the link is in the description. Additionally, coming up um, again later in the week, which is on about Tuesday, Wednesday of next week, we will be having a presentation with one of our favorites, Dr. Chetty. Um, we'll be having uh, Joachim, um, Gorcha, um, Joachim with us as well, as well as uh, Dr. Robin Rose, looking at microclots and some of the strategies to manage them. So it fits right in to what's been happening with regards to the embalmers. So before we any further ado, let's just try and add Thomas with us. Hi, Tom, how are you doing? Dr. McMillan, I'm doing great. Um, thanks for having me on the show again. Excellent, excellent. And so let's just start off with an introduction, Tom. And uh, just remind us again, in case someone hasn't met you, who you are. Yeah, my name's Tom Havland uh, from Dayton, Ohio. Spent 20 years in the United States Air Force, retired as a major, then spent 16 years as a defense contractor working with the Air Force after that. Um, retired and was looking at a film called Died Suddenly and uh, was interested in these six or seven embalmers that said they were seeing these strange white fibrous clots in their corpses. So I said, you know, I've got some data analysis skills. Maybe I could do a, uh, a survey to see whether or not these, these six or seven people are a bunch of kooks or this phenomenon is really happening all over the world. Excellent, Tom. And I think one of the things that you have highlighted is that everyone can get involved in science. Everyone has a role to play. Everyone can therefore make a difference. And it's fascinating that you took that one film, you observed something, you thought to yourself, I think I can help because I can do data analysis. Let's put something together and then take it from there. So we had spoken in May of 2023, and you had reached out, didn't you, to some of the um, the regulators about some of the findings. What had happened then? Yeah, uh, in our last survey that we did last year that I uh, talked to you about, there were three main conclusions that came out of that survey. We had uh, 179 embalmers respond to our first survey. There were three main conclusions. One was about seven out of every 10 embalmers that responded to that survey were seeing these unusual white fibrous clots that I'll show your audience right here in their corpses. And many of these embalmers, uh, Dr. McMillan, have been embalming for 20 or 30 years, and they've never seen anything like these white fibrous clots. So that was strange. I then asked them, uh, um, when did you start seeing these clots? And the main consensus of the embalmers is they started seeing them in the year 2021. There were a few embalmers, about 44 out of the survey, that said they saw them in 2020, which, as you know, is a year that we had the COVID virus, uh, but we did we did not have the uh, elephant in the room yet. And then, but many more of the embalmers started seeing these white fibrous clots in the year of 2021 when the elephant in the room came out. So, the last uh, result of that first survey that I thought was really shocking was many of these embalmers are seeing these clots in up to 50% or more of their corpses. So it was not a rare thing. It seemed to be a prevalent thing. So that was the conclusions of our first survey. I, when I had the results of that last January, Dr. McMillan, I sent those off immediately to the FDA, uh, to their Vaccine and Related Biological Products Advisory Committee. They had a meeting on the 26th of January of last year. And I actually asked to speak at that meeting. They had an hour set aside for oral presentations and they gave 20 speakers three minutes apiece to speak. Uh, but they had a lottery ensued, and I was not selected as one of the speakers. But I did submit all of my information in, in, on my survey in a written format, and I did get a tracking number from the FDA last year, last January. But throughout the year, Dr. McMillan, I was never contacted a single time 
by anybody from the FDA or the CDC. Yeah, these are these are worrying times. And I think that one of the problems that we've got is that when we make reference to the elephant in the room, and this is this is an important point, is that it, it's becoming a problem for many of our major public health scientific um, people is because as the as time passes, the more that they don't address these issues, the harder it is to say it's not related to the elephant in the room. It, it's even sad that I have to use the terminology, the elephant in the room, and hope that people understand what we're talking about. But it, it, this is very, very sad that at this stage in the context of a pandemic, especially when excess deaths are up across the world and those people who had seen Andrew Bridgen in the UK arguing that we need more investigation. I think it's more than just simple investigation. I think we need autopsies, lots mm -hmm. of autopsies. And this is where this kind of information would then be seen. Because what I don't think people understand is they're thinking to themselves, well, if this was a major issue, we would be seeing it in lots of autopsies. The problem is, is that there are not enough autopsies mm -hmm. being done when we have vaccinated deaths. We had a good number in the unvaccinated early in the pandemic, but when I made my presentation just last year, the first paper to be published was in January of 2023. And it's just not acceptable. So we, we do have some very big issues. Now, tell me, Tom, what problems did you have with regards to engagement from associations across the world? That same reluctance to do autopsies on the, over this issue seems to be permeating through to even the embalmers as well. Um, to refresh your audience's memory, I sent the survey out last year and this, this year to over 1,700 funeral homes directly around the world in major cities. I also sent the uh, survey to 50 national, regional, and state funeral director associations, each of those with hundreds of members, you know, funeral directors and embalmers underneath them. But by the, 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 uh, the, the results that I got, I, I've been able to deduce a few things, doctor. Of the 269 responses that I got around the world, 128 of them, almost 50%, came from the embalmers in a single state the state of Pennsylvania. And what was interesting about that is about five days after I uh, sent the survey out to the world on the 8th of December, uh, I checked my survey monkey collectors and I had only gotten about 14 responses to the survey. And I said, wow, this is terrible. I need to, so I got on the phone and I started calling the 30 U.S. state funeral director associations that I had sent to the United States. I sent it to the 30 most populated states. So I talked to either their funeral director association president or a secretary or somebody else in their office. And I said, you know, please send out our survey. Well, God bless the Pennsylvania uh, Funeral Directors Association headed by executive director Kathy Ryan, her assistant Allison Hinkle, and another woman named Sue. They did exactly what I asked them to do. They, they forwarded my email with the link to the Survey Monkey survey. Quick, you know, it only takes about four minutes to take, 12 quick questions. They forwarded it out to all their embalmers. And I know that because... The, the next day, I got up and looked, checked to my survey monkey collectors, and I had 93 responses, Dr. McMillan, from, from embalmers, and they were all from one state, Pennsylvania. I then got up the next morning, and I had 32 more responses from embalmers, and they were all from Pennsylvania. So a total of 125 responses in just two days. So it told me two things. It told me, first of all, the embalmers are indeed willing to tell you what they're seeing in the embalming room if they feel like they have the permission from their funeral director boss or from the state funeral director association. But it also told me, hey, I sent that email out to 29 other state, you know, funeral director associations, and they must not have forwarded it to their embalmers. Or else I would have seen a similar response from the embalmers in those states. So it tells me there's a lot of pressure at the higher levels, at the, at the either the funeral director associations or at the funeral home directors themselves that may not be getting the survey down to their embalmers to even take in the first place. You know, here's an important point, you know, is that I, I really am trying to understand why at this point in the pandemic, there would be such reluctance to just ask questions. There is really something psychological going on 
because these are just questions. Now, let me let me explain to people is that when we look at the power of scientific observation, that's what brought about Viagra. They were doing the research, looking at pulmonary hypertension, and they just observed that a number of men were getting erections, and they realized that wait, could this be having an impact? And that's what led to Viagra being such a valuable um, tool, helping so many men across the world. And when you have the failure to look at science and just to be observant, you don't have to know what it is, but if you notice a change, why would this not be considered significant? What happened with the UK? Did you send out any any? Um, surveys to the UK. I did. I sent surveys to over 400 funeral homes in cities like London, Manchester, Birmingham, Leeds, Liverpool, Belfast, Glasgow, Edinburgh, etc. I also sent it to six uh, major uh, funeral director associations, uh, one of which was the National Association of Funeral Directors of, of the UK, who sent me back an email saying they were not going to participate in the survey. They said, we'll let the British Institute of Embalmers uh, answer for us. Well, I had already sent an email to them as well, but you know, why would the National Association of Funeral Directors in the UK, who have hundreds of funeral director and embalmer members under their organization, not want to send out my email and encourage their embalmers to let me know what they're seeing in the embalming room, whether they're seeing the clots or not? It's it's, and I th I have two reasons why I believe uh, Dr. McMillan. I think first of all. Maybe these funeral directors and, and the funeral directors association presidents, who are almost always funeral directors themselves, may have mandated that all of their employees at their funeral home, including their embalmers, take the elephant in the room. So they may not want to participate in a survey that could potentially show a link between these unusual clotting issues, like these white fibrous clots, microclotting, et cetera, and the elephant in the room. The other reason is maybe a lot of these funeral directors may have taken the elephant in the room themselves. So there might be a little personal cognitive dissonance going on of them not wanting to know the answer to the question. Just a couple of yeah. thoughts. Yeah, these are significant problems that we face because from a scientific point of view, science doesn't really have an agenda. It's just about trying to understand an observation. Now, I'll give you another example, Tom, and I don't know if people can understand this one. Now, if we take it back to the 19, the late 1950s, when we had the issue with thalidomide. Now, it's not the same, but I'm using it as a, a template to show you where observation comes in. At the time, no one had seen these cases with babies being born without arms and legs. So it was unusual. It was an observation. We're talking about not one or two, hundreds across different countries were occurring. In total, I think there were 10,000 cases. The question is, why didn't the scientific community respond at that time? Well, part of the problem was they did think of the question. At that time, the elephant in the room was thalidomide. What they were told was that when the pharmaceutical company looked at the evidence, they looked at all the cases where there was babies born with arms and legs, and they looked across the whole board of people who had had the drug. And they came to the conclusion that because this did not occur in every case, it's unlikely to be the cause. And so the prescriptions continued for years. Wow. And so this is what I'm saying. You cannot afford to miss scientific observation because what you have to do is explain it. it. It's one thing to say, I don't think that it is, but it's very important to say what it is. Mm -hmm. Now we've done this twice already in the context of the pandemic. The first was when children had hepatitis. There was no clear cause. This happened across the world at the same time. Children just getting severe hepatitis, quite a number died. We still haven't clarified the cause, but we know what it is not. That's mm -hmm. what the scientific community mm -hmm. said. The next thing was the monkeypox. And again, the scientific community, this is across the world. We're talking about 80,000 cases not been seen in non-endemic regions. They were sure of what it was not, 
who could not explain what it was. <laughs> this yeah. kind of science is what causes the mistakes that mm -hmm. we are seeing today. And so we have seen it occur twice in my mind in a way that we should have correlated very clearly to see mm -hmm. if it was related to the elephant in the room. And we didn't. It seems we're doing it again. And there doesn't seem to be a determination to try and resolve this. This is quite significant. It really is. And, you know, the survey that I did, I, I made it as unbiased as possible. And none of the survey questions nor in the survey instructions do I ever mention the words COVID or the elephant in the room. Remember, we just asked the embalmers, what are you seeing? When did you start seeing it? And how much are you seeing it? What percentage of your corpses are you seeing it in? So we're asking them very basic questions. They're not qualified to discuss why or how the clots are forming. It's a scientific you know, information. They're just, their job is to get the body presentable, ready for, for a funeral to, to be done. So okay. we only well, ask them, you know. Let, let's get to the, to the research here, Tom. So this here is the worldwide um, survey. When did you finish the collection of the second round of data? Started on the 8th of December and finished on the 8th of January, and then immediately sent the, uh, the results to the uh, FDA, CDC, and NIH the following day on the 9th of January, including this presentation that we're about to see. Okay, good. So let's take some steps through it. Um, so, oops, oh, sorry. There we go. So this is the first question. Is this question one or question? Yes, this is question yeah. two. <clears throat> How uh, many years? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, question one, by the way, was uh, where are you from? We turned off the IP uh, tracking feature in SurveyMonkey and promised the embalmers they could stay anonymous. But we did ask him in our first question, what state are you living in the United States or you know, what uh, country in the UK are you from? What section of Australia, for example? What province in Canada? But so then, because uh, we wanted to check for regionality if it's possible, but we didn't get enough really responses either last year or this year to see if there was any regionality. So we, we really couldn't determine what, anything in terms of the bad batch theory. So our second question that we asked them is, hey, how many years have you been an active embalmer? As you can see, there's a, a lot of people have been embalming for over uh, 20 years. Average uh, is 15 years of experience, Dr. McMillan, which is a good thing, right? It tells me these are experienced embalmers. They know what things look like uh, in the years prior to the pandemic. Then in the year of 2020, when we had the virus, but we had no vaccines yet. And then in the year uh, 21 and, and after that, when we had both uh, the uh, COVID virus and the vaccines. Okay, right. So that's an important point. You're right. Um, most had over 20 years of experience. So yeah, so what they observed should be considered to be quite relevant. Okay. So question three was, how yep. many corpses did you personally embalm per year? What were you trying to figure out there? Just uh, how experienced are you? How often? Because some embalmers maybe uh, are very casual. They only embalm a body, you know, once every couple of weeks. Others, they'll do 300, 400, even 500 corpses a year. Uh, Mr. Richard Hirschman, who's a trade embalmer from Alabama, who's one of the died suddenly embalmers, is a trade embalmer. He, so he embalms at... Uh, about a dozen funeral homes. He actually works for those dozen funeral homes. So he'll he'll do, not surprisingly, two, sometimes even three bodies a day. So he's a, he's one of those that's probably had the over 300 bar. <laughs> so yeah. okay. the average is 100 corpses per year. So average wise, these embalmers, they know what they're talking about. They see, they see bodies on a regular basis. And just to, to clarify so that um, the, the audience understands, with the embalming process, it's about trying to preserve the body. And what they do is that they will get and um, they will try and inject, I think, and I have it part of my presentation here. I think that this may be useful for people to see. Um, so this here is the embalming procedure. I got this from a, um, a paper here. So they have a pump. They insert a catheter into the neck and they have another catheter inserted to the groin. Um, and I think that they then pump it through from one side and then the, the blood will then be pushed out so that all the clots then and the blood gets replaced by the embalming fluid, which primarily tends to be formaldehyde. 
And so this is just an example, I guess, of which locations you can go from. And then the blood is emptied from the bloodstream. And this is how you end up with preservation of the body. Is that about right, Tom? Yes. In fact, in our first survey, we asked uh, the embalmers what their favorite uh, injection site points are. And the most popular is the carotid artery in the neck, followed mm -hmm. by the iliac artery down in the pelvis, which then runs down to your femor femoral arteries in your legs. Mm -hmm. So that's what yeah. they typically work from. Although now there's some of the embalmers are having to work out of more than a couple of injection site points because when they run into these white fibrous clots, then it, it becomes more difficult. And their embalming process is, has gone from about an hour and a half to about uh, two and a half to three hours now when they run into bodies with that are riddled with these white fibrous clots because it's, it's more difficult. They have to stop, pull the clot out with forceps, and then continue with the embalming process and maybe go with a couple more injection site points like under the armpits and some other places. So All right. So let's move on to question four here. Did you observe any large white fibrous clot structures as seen in the photo above in the corpse, corpses that you embalmed in year 2023? And I guess you had a picture of what these white fibrous clots look like. Yeah, we did. We actually had a picture that was on an embalming stainless steel table of a, of a ruler right next to a white fibrous clot that was about six inches long and had a branch coming off of it was about four inches long. So it looked like a letter Y, but it was the same kind of color, you know, this, this kind of color of clot. So um, that's an alarming statistic, right? That, and that mirrors pretty much what we saw last year. Like I said, it was about seven out of every 10 embalmers. In this case, 197 out of the 269 responding to the survey are still seeing these white fibrous clots, even in 2023, after most Americans, by the way, are, are about uh, two years away from the last elephant in the room they took. Remember here in the, in the United States, the CDC and their vaccination tracker site said that 80% um, of American adults over the age of 18 took at least the first two elephants in the room, but then only about 20% of Americans, adults over the age of 18, took the BA4, BA5 bivalent booster back in the fall of 2022. And then even less, even about 15% of American adults over the age of 18 have taken the latest uh, XBB 1.5 booster that came out last fall, September of 2023. So that's kind of disturbing that you're still seeing these white fibrous clots when you're a couple of years out from the elephant in the room. Yeah, so part of the thing from a scientific point of view, and just so that people understand, even though my audience knows when I talk about the elephant in the room, what I'm getting at, we still don't know if it's necessarily connected. And that's part of the reason why the science still has to be done. Because at the moment, the scientific community is losing the battle because the association is that this is what it is. We need to do the yeah. work. We, we need to do the, the proper science. Okay. That's Let's a good move point on. because you're, you're right, because uh, correlation is not necessarily causation. But, you know, boy, we're seeing an awful lot of correlation here. So yeah, yeah it's something absolutely. that should be investigated. Yeah. yeah. So let's look at question number five. Yeah, what question percentage? Number, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, go ahead, Dr. Yeah. What percentage of the corpses in the year 2023 that you have embalmed have had the large white fibrous structures or clots? How is this different from question four? Uh, remember, in the first question, we asked them, uh, have you just seen the clots? So then the mm -hmm. next nat 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 natural question after that is, okay, you saw, you said you saw the clots. Now in what percentage of your corpses are you seeing the clots? And that'll okay. be the theme for the next couple of questions as well. So like I said, we're only asking them, did you see them? And then we're, we want to know how much, you know, when you saw them and how much, right? So this question answers the how much. And mm -hmm. as you see, the uh, if you take those uh, bars and you average them together, including the, the uh, green bar where we're 63 embalmers saw none of the clots, if you average all those in, you get an average of about 20% of the corpses of the uh, uh, of the uh, that the embalmer saw contain these large whitish fibrous clot structures. The good news is is that is down from the average of last year's survey that was about 30%. But again, this could be uh, not necessarily a good thing for the elephant in the room because, as I just said, it's been a couple of years since people got their elephant in the room. And you would think that maybe the further you get away from when people took their last injections, that the uh, that you might start to see the clots go down. My fear, Dr. McMillan, is with this all this new technology, 
with the mRNA and the uh, lipid nanoparticles going into other shots like flu, uh, you know, RSV, shingle shots, et cetera, that I'm afraid that we might see this uh, percentage go right back up again of these white virus clots if, and I say if, the injections and that technology is indeed responsible for what's happening. Yes, it's, it's an important question because uh, this is part of the problem that the scientific community are having, especially the pharmaceutical industry, is that if they don't address these questions, then it may become associated with the technology rather than anything else. Right. And yeah. Americans, want, and, and the world wants to know the answers to these questions, right? As I said, just said before, 80% of Americans uh, have taken, uh, you know, take the, taken the elephant in the room. So obviously they, they would like to know the answers to these questions. Are, are, are things safe for me? So, yeah, so the very, very important points. Okay, so let's move on to question number six. And in question number six is, did you observe any microclotting in the corpses that you embalmed in the year 2023, as evidenced by the appearance of coffee ground? or dirty blood in the drainage. Can you explain that a little bit? Yeah, this is a question we did not get a chance to ask last year. Last year focused mainly on the white fibrous clots. But many of the embalmers were telling me during this year that, hey, I'm also seeing, and they don't describe it as microclotting. They describe it, like I said, as what looks like coffee grounds and the blood that's draining off the corpse as they're trying to get the formaldehyde in. They also call it dirty blood as well. And as you can see there, an alarming percentage, Dr. McMillan, 212 of the 269 embalmers that responded to the survey, 79% are seeing this phenomenon now, as opposed to only 21% that said they were not. So this is quite, a, and as we know, microclotting can be just as dangerous as these large white fibrous clots, because microclotting occurs at this very small vessels, the capillary level, and can block the blood flow uh, and the exchange of oxygen at the lungs, for example, and then the, 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 the flow of that oxygen into other major organs of the body, including your brain, places like your eyes, you know, they have very small capillaries. So this could be just as, uh, as damaging as the white fibrous clots. Very concerning. Yes, I, I agree with you because one of the um, questions I had was that if the big clots are being formed, um, I would expect that we would see it on angiograms. And um, and so this is why I have always thought that it occurs primarily, not necessarily exclusively, uh, post-mortem, but that's a discussion we'll have. But the coffee-grown clots that you're describing there, that's a completely different proposition. Mm -hmm. That would be extremely difficult to see, and it would cause widespread organ dysfunction, probably in the form of small infarcts. But Again, uh, when you think about it, if it was causing that much damage, it's difficult to imagine that we wouldn't be seeing it clinically. So I'm, I'm trying to get my head around it. But it, it's still an important observation. And it does seem to highlight that point about microclots being a major issue. Um, it's the next the slide will show us uh, what percentage of the, of the corpses that my, of the um, embalmers are seeing this phenomenon in. You can yes. see it's an average of 25%. And, uh, you know, if you look over to the left and you look at the bars, you can see, for example, 58 of the embalmers said they were actually seeing this between 21 to 40% of their corpses. Another 32 embalmers said they were seeing this phenomenon between 41 to 60% of their corpses. There was even 16 embalmers that said, I'm seeing this microclotting, uh, this, this coffee grounds, dirty blood is the way they describe it, and 61 to 80% of their corpses. And in the years... Uh, Prior to uh, the COVID virus, uh, embalmers would very rarely see this phenomenon. They see it in less than 5% of their corpses. I think one of the embalmers told me he'd, he would saw it in uh, chemo patients, ones that had, had heavy doses of chemotherapy. So I, I can't uh, say that for sure, but I, I seem to recall that's what, what he was telling me. But in, in any event, it's a, it's a phenomenon that's increased in, uh, you know, about five times uh, since uh, the years 2019 and prior. Very distressing. Yeah, wow. So, okay, um, moving on to the next question here. Um, this question, I'm going to have to clarify a point about it. What percentage of the corpses in 2023 that you've embalmed have had traditional grape jelly blood clots? Now, before we go on, I'll just show you, um, the audience, what we mean by the grape jelly. This was taken from an image from Died Suddenly. So, um, just for credit of the image. So they have this picture here. So these white ones are what we'd call the fibrous clots. 
but this is more typical of a, a blood clot, the grape jelly uh, appearance. So this is at the end of one of them. So when you said grape jelly like this, this is primarily what you're talking about. Is that right? Yeah, at the very end of that one that's in the middle here, you see that real dark jelly looking. That's what yeah. a grape jelly, and, and they dissolve easily in your hands. We asked the embalmers about the grape jelly clots. Like you say, they've been seeing those forever, along with what's called chicken fat clots. They're yellowish mm -hmm. in nature. They tear very easily, and they're uh, much smaller than these large white fibrous clots. But embalmers have been seeing grape jelly clots forever, and uh, they dissolve easily in your hands. But the last couple of years, when we asked them the survey last year, the embalmer said, hey, we're seeing them in a higher percentage of our corpses ever since uh, the year 2020. And we're also, um, they've also gotten a little bit more viscous. They're more like grape jam now than grape jelly. So that could be mm. a little uh, yeah, distressing as well because the consistency has gotten thicker over the last couple and of years. So 40% of corpses in 2023. And what, what was it previously? Go to the next slide and you'll see what it was. It was okay. 30 percent, so it's increased about ten percent from the from the year twenty nineteen and prior to the uh, this this last year twenty twenty three. So not a great increase, but still enough to be significant, right, and be of concern. Mm. And so, in effect, so this was prior to twenty nineteen. What percentage of the corpses that you embalmed had traditional um, grape jelly? So yeah. this is thirty percent prior to twenty nineteen. So as you said they would normally see it, but they're seeing, at, seeing it at a far more significant level. And so it is important for people to understand that it is not just the fact that they are seeing, say, more grape jelly. It's grape jelly plus the coffee ground microclots plus the white fibrous clot. So it's a combination of clotting. Uh, from a scientific point of view, I can't I, I, this does sound very important. I can't quite understand anyone with a scientific mind who wouldn't be curious to explain it. And I can't understand anybody who discounts it without researching it. Those are the two things that make no sense to me. You can't discount it if you haven't looked at it. So you can't say, well, I don't think it's significant. But I don't see how you can say that you don't think it's significant if it is such a significant transition over the period of time. As I said, you don't know what the cause is. And so the assumption at the moment is that it's related to the elephant in the room. I think that that is a problem that the scientific community has to address. They need to know what the cause is so that they can categorically say it is so and so leaving it as it is, is really, really dangerous. I couldn't agree with you more, Dr. McMillan. And, as, you know, it was easier for them to dismiss this anecdotally when it was just six or seven embalmers in a movie that said they were seeing this. But now that this survey's out and I have 200 embalmers out of 269 that said they're seeing these phenomenon, it becomes much more difficult for the powers that be to ignore this. And that's the whole reason I did this. the survey was to either – negate these six or seven embalmers and call them kooks or to confirm what they were indeed seeing and by the responses to the survey. And like I said, these embalmers, for example, from the state of Pennsylvania that I met, mentioned earlier, there was 128 embalmers from that state. About 70% of them said they were seeing these kind of clots and the other 30% said they were not. So it was very similar to what I got for the overall results of the survey. Hmm. So I, I believe what the embalmer, I believe what the, what the majority of the embalmers are telling me. That they, they are indeed seeing these things. This is a real phenomenon, and it's hard to ignore it when, like I say, you can, you can hold it in your hand and see it. This is one of those yeah. side effects that's easy to see. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so let's look at question number 10. Uh, did you, uh, the embalmers, see increased numbers of infant deaths, miscarriages, fetal demise, and stillborn since in year 2023 when compared to years 19 and prior? Yeah, and th this is a very sad issue, obviously. You know, a loss of a child is a devastating thing for a couple. And the good news, I guess, is that 80% of the embalmers, or, you know, 69% there, say that they did not see that phenomenon. 21%, however, said they did. And so, mm -hmm. you know, that's not a good thing. And then if you go to the next slide, we'll see in what, what percentage of their, uh, yeah, what percent so increase in embalmings of infant deaths. Uh, 
did you see in 2023 when you compare it to the year 2019 and prior? And if you mm-hmm. average the bars there together, ex- excluding the blue bar, not not in, not counting the 159 involvers that said they were not seeing this, but if you average the other bars together, you get a 25% increase in infant deaths for those that actually saw the increase in 2023 when compared to the years 2019 and prior. So you know, there's a couple of reasons I think that um, some of the embalmers may not have seen uh, the this phenomenon. Uh, oftentimes the body's not presentable for embalming. Uh, the, there's a lot of, uh, some of the embalmers have told me there's more cremations going on at infants these days. And there seems to be a change in some of the hospital policies. In fact, in fact uh, I think embalmer John O'Looney uh, in uh, the UK, right in your neck of the woods, I said there's uh it seems like the hospitals now are kind of swooping in more after there's been a, a miscarriage or a fetal demise and say hey we'll take care of the remains for you to the to the grieving parents so the parents may you know and they're in shock obviously what was supposed to be a happy occasion now is now turned into a disaster so they just say yeah I want the problem to go away so if the if there is more of that happening more cremations and more of the hospital taking care of the body then any evidence that there might be clotting issues in the infant could be uh, getting destroyed without, you know, anybody noticing it. Yeah, yeah, it's important things. Okay, let's look at question number 12 here. Um, what age groups did you observe an increase in the number of clots, any type, in the year 2023 compared to the years 2019 and pra? Please check all age groups that are apply. Please check none if you've seen um, none in any average age group. Yeah, all the other questions, we, they only had one answer to answer. This one, they could click on multiple answers for, for all the age groups that apply. As you can see, uh, the embalmers did overall see an increase in blood clots of you know the grape jelly, the white fibrous, and the microclotting in all age groups. Uh, the, the longest bars, uh, it didn't surprise me, Dr. McMillan, that the uh, you know, the longest bars were in the older age group, such as the 66 to 80 year old group. What distresses me a little bit is that 36 to 50 year old bar. That's a pretty decent sized bar. 89 of the embalmers said that they were seeing an increase in that particular age group, which you don't usually associate with uh, having heart attacks and strokes at that age. You know, you expect people when, once they get into their late 50s, early 60s, to start having problems with cholesterol, plaque build up in the pipes and your your blood vessels, and uh, you know, so I didn't, I wasn't that um, surprised at those bars, but I was at the 36 to 50 year old group, and that seems to dovetail pretty closely with the insurance uh, disability and death data that Edward Dowd's been collecting. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, we, we're seeing every day somebody else dying, um, and it's very difficult for people to correlate it and say well is this really what was happening before the pandemic nobody can quite remember and how much of it is related to the fact that we still have circulating virus my my point has always been is that i think it's a combination of two things i think it's like the epoxy you have two tubes you mix them together and you get a very strong resin but each on its own doesn't cause that much of a problem that's what i think is happening at the moment as i've always said we're in what we call a challenge study where there is high levels of virus after you've had population immune priming this was not supposed to happen we have no idea what the outcomes of this are going to be and so this is why i'm worried about the lack of vigilance the scientific and medical community needs to be vigilant really vigilant needs to be no agendas just about trying to understand and learning how to mitigate that's that's my view Uh, let's look at the conclusion here that you came up with um at the at the time before you go there i want to um add on to your point there you know this could be a thing that's happening subtly that people may not notice it in their everyday lives uh many of these countries that have had the elephant in the room and are highly uh at a high percentage of their population I've seen an increase of about 10% excess mortality over the last three years compared to countries like those in Africa that have very low uptake on the elephant in the room. And what's interesting about that, in my country, the United States of America, we have about 300 million people and about 3 million of us uh, prior to COVID died of natural causes, you know, heart attacks, you know, car accidents, cancers, et cetera. 
about 3 million of us died. And if you have a 10% increase in excess mortality, like we have the last three years, well, that's 10% of 3 million people. So that's 300,000 extra Americans dying every year for some unknown cause, right? So when people see it in their daily lives, it's a 10% increase is like, okay, instead of 10 people that I know dying, 11 died this year. Are you really going to know that, you know, you notice that big difference between 10 and 11 dying? But that's what we're talking about. It's subtle, but when you aggregate it up into the mass of world population, you wind up with astronomical numbers of people that are, uh, you know, in excess mortality and they're dying of a cause that the, the uh, medical community cannot put their finger on, strangely. Yeah. Yeah, so this that's an important. I've been an uh, uh, advocate for or studying the excess mortality. I mean, it, it it is complex. It is nuanced. It's not easy statistically to differentiate because uh, it's not so much ten percent of the population, but it's a it's an increase in the numbers beyond what you would expect. But it is still a very important statistic, which is why it's monitored. This is why it's measured, and this is why it shouldn't be ignored. And even if excess death numbers were not elevated, that would still be a flag, because after you had three years of excess deaths, you should be way below the normal. And so whichever way we take it, this is very important. So when you have this situation of high excess deaths, unexplained science, in my view, that is completely unacceptable. I, again, I, I've, I think we are at a point now where we do have to start calling out the scientific community. I have hesitated to do that because I, I do understand how people are thinking. However, we are at a point where we don't have time. If this is occurring and this is significant, this is not a place for people to have agendas. This is just science. This is just finding answers. This is about mitigating damage. We don't need people who are playing games. Really seriously, we are at that point now. And so I think I may have to start calling it out. I don't like the idea of it because we are always have to respect everyone else as a professional. Mm. But this is unacceptable. Yeah. You read my mind exactly, Dr. McMillan, and that's exactly what I did when I had the results of this survey done on the 8th of January, by the 9th of January, I had all the data wrapped up and I immediately sent it to the FDA, CDC, and the NIH to multiple addresses at those locations. But I also CC'd along the way, some of our friends like uh, Steve Kirsch of the Vaccine Safety Research Foundation, Dr. Peter McCullough, Andrew Bridgen, your, M your MP. He's got, he's got, he has the results of my survey. So I want to make sure that they know what was turned into the FDA, CDC, and NIH. So if they fail to do anything with the data that I provided to them this year, just like they did last year, if they fail to do anything with it, then people could start to call them out and say, hey, why haven't you done your own investigation of this? This guy is get, showing you data that looks like there's a terrific signal here that uh, you know the elephant in the room needs to be investigated as a potential cause of these white fibrous clots, microclotting, uh, grape jelly clots, all these issues happening. And uh, it, it's worthy of study that a retired Air Force guy shouldn't have to do it by himself. It should be yeah. done by, by professionals at the CDC, NIH, and FDA. Excellent. Yeah. So let's look at your conclusion here. Yeah. Um, so, okay. You, you want to take us through what you were saying with this? Yeah. Just to recap the slides we looked at, uh, the white fibers clots are definitely still an issue in 2023. Recall that the embalmers have been embalming for 20 or 30 years, had never seen these prior to the years of COVID and the COVID vaccines. Uh, over 70% of the embalmers are still seeing uh, these white fibers clots in 2023, an average of about 20% of their corpses. So this is not a rare thing. Neither is microclotting. This is an issue as well. It used to be back in the years 2019 and prior, only about 5% of corpses had these uh, this microclotting in, in them. Uh, it's now close to 80% of the embalmers are seeing an average of, uh, are seeing these microclots in about 25% of the corpses. Again, they see it in what they call dirty blood or coffee grounds. That's the way they recognize it. The grape jelly clots, as we said earlier, still an issue. Uh, 
and ballers have seen those forever. And they used to see them uh, pre-2019 in about 30% of their corpses. And that has now gone up to about 40% of their corpses in 2023. An additional uh, 20 embalmers said they were seeing an increase in infant deaths, a very sad uh, thing. And they're seeing an increase of about 25% in those that are seeing that phenomenon. Embalmers are also seeing an overall increase in clotting of all types, the grape jelly clots, the uh, white fibrous clots, and the microclotting in all age groups, but most notably in ages 36 years old and up. And then the last, last thing, as I mentioned earlier, I immediately sent off the information to the FD, FDA and CDC. I think they should actually halt the uh, vaccination program of the uh, elephant in the room and, uh, you know, do an immediate I actually are safe and effective because I, the, the data seems to indicate possibly otherwise. Mm. Yeah, these are important calls. I mean, um, it's, I guess, not up to us to make that decision, but it does need to go in front of the appropriate regulators for them to reflect on it and to make sure that they're acting in a way that is in the interest uh, of their population. Um, I think that I'm, I'm just reflecting about um, what I had thought initially when it came to looking at why we have these strange clots. One of them I had mentioned when I'd done this presentation, and there'll be a link in the description. It's, it's a free course where I went through some of my thoughts. And um, I was highlighting that... Um, I thought that because they were precipitating at low temperatures, it was suggestive that they could be cryoglobulins, which are just aggregations of immunoglobulins which can occur, which would then cause this white fibrous kind of pattern that you, you could see happening. But it doesn't fully explain, certainly the microclotting, that's, that's a different beast, and I'm, I'm going to be thinking about that, um, to try and see if we can understand what are some of the the patterns here? Um, I'm going to quickly show as well. Uh, there was this was something that was in the Epoch Times that I, I thought was significant. Um, this was since about last year. They did get, get it published as an article about embalmers finding numerous fibrous clots. The, the bit that I, I wanted to look at was here, where they did look at the clot analysis. And they were specifically looking at the characteristics in that it had blood clots or the normal uh, clots previously had 35% parts per million magnesium versus 1.7. So it's low magnesium, very low potassium. Um, you low can iron. see here low iron. So what that suggests is that it's not composed of red blood cells. Because Correct. magnesium, potassium, iron would probably be. So this is why it's probably white. Yeah. Low copper as well. Uh, relatively low zinc. About the same amount of slightly more aluminium. Aluminium is a problem. This is, this is interesting, actually. I've just noticed this. Um, more sodium. Sl higher carbon. Uh, significantly higher calcium. Um, that, again may suggest maybe an alternative clotting pathway that it's using. Very high levels of tin, it's really unusual. Um, I'll have to look into that. Um, low levels of chlorine and higher levels of phosphorus. So it, the, the characteristics are not typical and it, it's something that definitely needs. I mean, it's frightening that we have had these questions now around for some period of time and they still haven't haven't been been answered. I'm going to show you here another article that was published in November. Uh, this was by Russell Baylock, and he was asking the questions, ignored dangers of the COVID-19 injections. This was published in 2023, uh, Surgical Neurology International. Uh, the bit that I wanted to highlight um, was where lower down, if I can find it, or it has disappeared now. Um, I'll come back to that in a in a second. I'll find the location and show you. But there, he was looking at and asking the question. Uh, I've got it here now. Um, several morticians have stated that they cannot inject their embalming fluid because of the extensive clotting in the bodies, something they have never seen before. They have also removed very long clots from major uh, major vessels as well. 
And even better proof comes from autopsy studies performed by Michael Palmer and Dr. Bakhti, in which the attachment of the vaccine-generated spike proteins to the walls of blood vessels were demonstrated by immunohistochemistry techniques. So the point is, is that there are some scientists who are looking at this, but not enough. This really takes a lot of work to try and see if we can break down what is occurring and why. And most critically, from a clinical point of view, is it relevant in the clinical context where we have to do something to reduce that risk, to reduce the risk of other diseases in patients? That's where it's really critical to to understand. And I'll tell you, Dr. McMillan, the uh, embalmers that I talk to are insistent that the clots are definitely forming pre-death as well as post-death. Because they're picking up bodies that are only an hour or two old, and during the embalming process, they'll find them riddled with these white fibrous clots, which they say they had no no way could they have formed that quickly in just the hour or two after the body, uh, you know, was was deceased. So they're convinced that it's. They're not saying it's not happening after death as well, but they're convinced it is happening prior to death, and then obviously causing uh, strokes and heart attacks if it blocks off a major blood vessel or a part breaks off and you know gives you a stroke, uh, an aneurysm. So it's a it's an unfortunate thing. Um, the uh, the textbooks, by the way, in the past do not show these kind of white fibrous clots. There's been a lot of people trying to debunk the existence of the white fibrous clots and say they don't exist. They said I show you the vial. Uh, other other naysayers say, oh, they, they've always existed. Well, if they've always existed. Why are, why aren't they showing up in the old medical books when you just see just the grape jelly clots and the chicken fat clots? So the naysayers, I believe, are wrong. I believe the majority of the embalmers have said they are seeing this phenomenon, that the that phenomenon is new since since 2020. Um, so it's it's like I said, it's, it's a dis- disturbing thing, and I challenge just like you do the medical community to go out and do further research about this because it's something that needs to be looked into. Uh, because, because yeah, it's just it's it the problem's not stopping. Yeah. So I'm I'm going to be asking you your final thoughts in a minute, Tom. And just again, for the sake of the audience, just so that you're not squeamish, I'll tell you what we're doing. I want you again to really bring that close to the camera. Let's just see what this looks like. And just turn it, just rotate it. That really is quite remarkable. And yes, I can see it has no red blood cells in it. It's just proteins in the blood that have coagulated together. Dr. Ryan Ryan Cole hmm. has looked at it under his microscope and and, um, says it's a combination of um, fibrin. You know how when the endothelial lining of the the, uh, walls of the vessel, inner walls of the vessel is damaged in any way, then it triggers the uh, fibrinogen in the blood to turn into fibrin basically going from a liquid into a solid. And then that also, it also promotes the aggregation of platelets, which are colorless. The fibrin's white in color. The platelets are colorless. They combine together. And then we think it's, it's also an additional amyloid or amyloid-like uh, protein in there as well. And those three combine together to form these white fibrous clots. That's one of the theories that's being worked on and looked at right now. And to me, it seems yeah. like the most practical one. Yeah, yeah. So... So final thoughts, Tom, you know, um, take us from your military perspective, because sometimes when you put people in their their role, is there any kind of analogy that you can imagine that the military would ignore when they saw something that was significant? You know, I was a data analyst and electrical engineer for years in the United States Air Force. Like I said, 20 years in the Air Force. 16 years as a defense contractor, worked with a a lot of uh, U.S. fighter aircraft like the F-16, the F-22, and the F-117 stealth fighter. And whenever we would see a problem uh, through the data, through looking at the data, in any kind of electrical system or any kind of communications, radar system, landing gear, whatever it was, we would immediately bring that uh, information to the attention of our superior officers. And for them, if they ever ignored that information and it wound up causing airplanes to crash and pilots to die, it would be catastrophic. So I'm calling on the FDA and CDC and NIH to take a look at this data. 
in the same way that we would look at data uh, over an aircraft, you need to look at this data as well and do further investigation because the results of not looking at it can be catastrophic. Absolutely. Quite right. Thank you very much, Tom. And just as a final point, we are going to be talking about microclotting next week, Wednesday. Look out for the links for that. I'll be sharing it shortly. If you are interested in what I'd presented before about uh, my thoughts on the cryoglobulins, it's in the links in the description below as well. And um, yes, we are in difficult times, everyone. And I think that the responsibility now is upon the public to challenge the scientists, doctors, politicians. It is not acceptable to not have answers. I repeat that. It is not acceptable to not have answers. If you don't know, you must research. You must do autopsies. You must make sure that you have applied yourself as far as you can to protect the interests of the public. If they found that there were no problems, that's fine. But to not look at this stage with excess deaths, abnormal findings, is bordering, if not negligent. Let's hope that we have a better future ahead of us. And there is a responsibility from the public to push everybody who needs to do what they need to do to protect the interests of everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much, Tom. You can just wait with me until we play the outro. Okay.